Okay, so Robert Anderson, uh, he is now Professor Emeritus in History at the University of Edinburgh, where he had the Chair of Modern History from 1994 to 2007, and where he worked from 1969 until his retirement. And in the course of his career, Anderson extensively studied British and European higher education systems in the last three centuries and their significance in the selection and intellectual training of national and continental elites. And in the last 10 years, his books concerning the European universities since the Enlightenment and British universities past and present had a significant reception among international scholars, as well as his um, earlier research on university and universities and elites in Britain since 1-800. Uh, Anderson is now working on the history of Scottish universities since the re-elaboration of the so-called Humboldtian model in a comparative European dimension. And uh, he is also a member of the editorial board of the History of Universities and representative for the United Kingdom at the Commission Internationale pour l'Histoire des Universités. And now I let him speak about uh, the presentation in the panel. Thank uh, you. Well, thank you. Is this working? Yes. Uh, yeah, it is. Yeah. Sure. Um, well, I will speak slowly, I think, partly because I'm trying to think about it as I go along. Um, we have had papers about three very different countries, uh, but I think uh, many interesting comparisons do arise. When I, when I first thought about this conference, I thought the period 1914 to 1968 falls obviously into two periods divided by the Second World War. Um, that political chronology doesn't necessarily work for Spain or, or Argentina, but really the three papers of uh, today's, or this morning's presentations have been about the second part of this period, really from the 1940s onwards. And with the exception perhaps of the uh, last part of the paper on Japan, we haven't heard so much about finance, we have heard more about governance. And governance can mean internal governance of universities, who holds the power, professors, or the kind of lay body that uh, the Americans tried to create in Japan, what role do students play in the governance of universities. But on the whole, the, the major issue that's been discussed under governance is the relationship between the central state and universities themselves. In other words, it's about university autonomy. And uh, there's, in, in principle, at any rate, there's a clear distinction between systems where a central state on Napoleonic lines uh, determines university policy, finances universities, appoints the professors, and so on, and uh, situations where universities are autonomous or corporate bodies. And clearly this, this was the kind of model, the second model, which the American occupying forces were, were trying to introduce in Japan. Um, within Europe, it's more familiar perhaps to compare in the 19th century, uh, the French model and the German model as ones which were uh, influential and, and the cause of uh, much debate in other countries, including Spain, but also including Italy. However, what do we mean by the liberal model? This, this phrase has been already much used. Um, perhaps we can agree it means socially an elite university, a bourgeois university, which is uh, particularly associated with uh, public service with a political elite with the so-called liberal professions like law. Uh, but what does the liberal model mean politically? Um, to me, as, as a 19th century historian, I would tend to link it with liberal constitutionalism, that autonomous universities were seen within a, a pluralistic system as uh, part of a civil society that was independent of the state or semi-independent of the state and to contrast that with, again, the, the centralized state model. But of course, this is also called the liberal model uh, because of its association, uh, well, it's partly perhaps in Spain a matter of 
political vocabulary that uh, liberal has a specific meaning of the kind of anti-clerical parties which uh, establish a state system independent of the church. So liberal can mean centralized state model as well as meaning university autonomy. And that is perhaps something we, we might need to discuss further. Well, the case of Spain, I think, shows it's quite difficult to, to equate the liberal model with, with political change because uh, if you define the liberal model as being political autonomy or, or university autonomy, then it is, it seems, under Franco that, uh, or certainly in the later years of the Franco regime, uh, that more autonomy is given to the universities. So university autonomy is not necessarily a liberal thing in itself. Uh, autonomous universities can be conservative bodies. Um, the papers on Spain and Argentina, I think, both raise the question of the role of the Catholic Church in the 20th century in supporting conservative movements. And a liberal university system, perhaps the case of Argentina showed, could also be combined with a quite repressive attitude towards, uh, towards radical ideas, towards uh, political freedom. So, um, again, in the case of Argentina, Peron in some ways seems to be uh, a democratic kind of ruler in a social, if not a political sense, uh, at least uh, rhetorically proclaiming that uh, universities should be open to all according to capacity and not, and not to birth or wealth, uh, although the, the practice didn't live up to, to the rhetoric. And I wonder whether in that case it's because Peron was so, his power depended so much on the trade unions and on a kind of proletarian version of democracy that uh, those people weren't necessarily very interested in university education in the way perhaps that uh, the lower ranges of the middle class were under other sorts of regimes. So our first point is perhaps that um, this one, that greater university autonomy doesn't necessarily go with greater political liberalism. The second point is that a strongly centralized state system um, may serve the interests of the liberal elite, and this is certainly the case in, in the 19th century, in France, in Italy, in Spain, um, and in that sense, uh, centralization, again, is, is a potentially radical force rather than a, a repressive one, as maybe 19th century liberals in countries like Britain tended to think. And in the 20th century, the centralized state can be, generally has been perhaps, uh, in the second half of the 20th century, a force for democratization, that uh, the state was concerned with extending uh, opportunities to attend universities, and in that sense it might come up against the conservative force of universities that didn't much want to change. Well, the Japanese example I thought was interesting because the Americans clearly want to introduce um, a more mobile, open society in Japan. Uh, the Japanese are concerned with preserving an elite and also the, um, uh, I think an important aspect of that was the idea of a national system that's producing a national elite. And this of course has historically been one of the functions of the university in, in Europe as well. A strong homogeneous system uh, can be part of a national culture and is valued for that reason. Well, what the Japanese example also showed, I think, was the state can use its financial power to preserve a hierarchy of universities and uh, the, the strong continuity between pre-war and post-war years um, shows that when, when uh, expansion or democratization of universities takes place, this is often through 
founding new universities, which are of lower social prestige, but which leave the older ones uh, intact. And uh, in many ways, that is what's happened in, in Britain as well. And as I think um, Kramer suggested in the written version of his paper, which I saw, uh, maybe the American system itself was not quite as egalitarian as the Americans like to think when recommending it to, to other countries. Well, we finish in 1968, and I suppose the process of democratization has only just begun then, although it's already leading, or massification as it was also described, it's also uh, leading to tensions by then. And I would like to suggest um, this period between about 1945 and 1968 actually has two conflicting phases. Uh, in the 1940s and 1950s, certainly in Western Europe, there's a reaction against totalitarianism. There's, there's a reaction uh, inspired by the Cold War, uh, an attempt very much to restore the liberal model of the university. And that involves university autonomy, among other values. And for a time, at any rate, the, uh, the model which seems attractive is quite a conservative one of the, the university based on colleges, based on residence, based on uh, a kind of moral training as well as purely intellectual training. Um, Paola Carlucci, in, his, his, in her history of the Scuola Normale, shows how for a time at any rate, this model was seen as a model perhaps for the general reform of the Italian university system, uh, that uh, Oxford on the Arno was, was to be uh, how universities would develop. And similarly in, in Britain, actually, you see the small residential collegiate university is taken as the model for university expansion uh, in the 1950s and early 1960s. But that conflicts really with the... Um, with the pressures for uh, expansion. Now, these pressures could be coped with by, in the Japanese fashion, by founding quite different sets of universities. They could be coped with as generally in, in Western Europe by simply expanding the existing universities, accepting far greater numbers into those. And that creates tensions, notably perhaps in West Germany, where the attempt to go back to a maybe nostalgically conceived Humboldtian model in the 1950s and 60s creates the tensions which made um, 1968 a particularly radical movement, perhaps, uh, in that country. Well, that also involves the, the rise of a student movement. Uh, clearly, the situations in Spain and Argentina were ones where students are allied with other forces of the left to um, which are much more explosive kind uh, than in countries which are uh, at that time more democratic. And in looking at the origins of 1968, one would have to look at that. Well, we didn't discuss finance very much, but I think the expansionism of the 1960s does create a sort of financial paradox. If you want to democratize your universities, it seems natural that that means making them free, uh, particularly if you want to admit more working class students, you abolish fees. Well, Perron, it seems, did that, although he wasn't prepared to spend the money which was necessary to really expand the system. That was what I picked up on Argentina. But it creates a paradox. You abolish fees, great, more students go to university, but it creates much more financial pressure on the state, which now has to pay for far more university places. And for a time, that pressure can be accommodated, maybe in the 1960s, maybe in the 1970s, when uh, the uh, economies of most Western countries are expanding, but of course, it leads ultimately to a crisis which, uh, um, in the age of neoliberalism, we are certainly uh, experiencing now, where 
the idea of a completely free university system comes under enormous pressure. Uh, the idea that students should contribute to their own education is reintroduced and uh, fees become, in fact, a highly controversial matter in many countries today. Well, that's perhaps an inadequate summary of these three papers, but I hope it has suggested some ideas we might take up in later discussions. Thank you. Okay.